I made a very interesting discovery. Most of the great priests of the Hopi, Navajo, Zuni groups of peoples were like the prophets of the Old Testament. They revealed the will of the deities. They perpetuated a certain set doctrine or documentary process which they preserved through their sand paintings, their catchiness, and their various ritual dances. These ancient procedures began we do not know how long ago, but certainly at least a thousand years. And until very recently, the life of the tribes was built upon these procedures, these doctrines. And the whole summary of it is that a doctrine that had come from the past was accepted without question, and its procedures were followed, and its ceremonies were kept. And these obediences constituted religion. Religion was therefore an obedience to a kind of arbitrary code of unknown origin, which had been carried forward, sanctified, and accepted. In the last 25 or 30 years, a number of young people have come up in these villages. Many of them have found it profitable to continue the arts and crafts of their ancestors. They work in turquoise and in silver. They also still weave a few blankets. They make various native drawings and symbols on wood or cardboard representing the deities of old and the Kachina masks. These are beautifully done and have a very ready sale, and along with pottery and baskets, constitute a major source of income. Also, these modern works are expensive. Now, what has happened? Somewhere along the line, these younger people began to interpret their own beliefs. Up to that time, no one had interpreted them. They had accepted them. But the young people on the reservations now are talking in terms of Zen and extrasensory perception. They are discussing Oriental philosophies, and they are incorporating into their work evidences of a new interpretive value which was not previously present. Now the difference seems to have been caused not only by contact with outside sources and greater educational opportunities, but by the inevitable needs of these people. These native uh, tribes and people are very intelligent. They are thoughtful, they are uh, patient, but they are intelligent. And in the course of time it has dawned upon many of these that it was not only necessary to perpetuate the old doctrines with great care, but it was necessary to adapt the old to the needs of the new. And this is called interpretation. Now, interpretation did not begin on the mesas of the American Southwest. Interpretation has existed everywhere. And interpretations are frequently reinterpreted a number of times because of the changing pressures of circumstances and the unfolding needs of the individual. The individual of today who is thoughtful cannot accept without question 
the literalisms of ancient believing. He cannot simply be satisfied to listen uh, to the patriarchs of old and accept without question anything that they reported or regarded as significant. Perhaps the main separating factor was the gradual unfoldment within the individual of the realization that he had the power to think. Very primitive tribes and probably our cave ancestors uh, did not have very extensive intellectual equipment. Therefore, they depended upon their priests and their leaders for all of their wisdom. And these, in turn, depended upon a mysterious order of beings called the gods. And the gods were the parents of the tribes and the clans. The gods made all the decisions. The gods saved man. The gods cursed man. The gods hardened the hearts of the pharaohs, and he also answered prayers for rain and fecundity. The god of the tribe was the master, the autocrat, the absolute ruler, and the people in all emergencies turned to him. And descending from this line of thinking gradually over a period of time, we come to medieval Europe and medieval Asia, in which the divine right of kings was merely a transference of the God image to the ruling monarch. But with one mysterious spiritual power responsible for everything, and this power subject to a variety of moods, so that deities became angry and petulant, they developed rather unfortunate moral complications. It became perhaps a little difficult for the believer to have full confidence in deities as these were recorded in mythology with their curio curious behaviorisms. So gradually the unfolding intelligence of the individual made a very important discovery he began to examine himself. He began to search for his own place in the plan of things. He wished to experience something of individuality, of, of identity. He wanted to have something to say about his future and how he was going to change society according to his own feelings. The deities remained, but they were more or less distant and gradually many of their powers were taken over by the people themselves. And out of this began what we like to term today the concept of mysticism. Mysticism was the transference of the leadership of life from outside factors to internal powers. The individual began to realize that there was within himself a capacity for growth, for unfoldment, for maturity, for enrichment, that he also had something to say about what he should believe and what he should not believe. But most of all, he wanted to know more about what he believed. He did not wish to accept merely a statement because it came from an authority. And gradually the seat of authority was moved from the heavens to his own mind. And his own thinking became the basis of his judgments and his decisions. Now this process occurred largely in that period which we call classical history. The process of gradually transferring the rulership of the universe uh, from mysterious abstract deities and placing this responsibility upon individuals, upon human beings, making them not only masters of their own souls, but also obligated to themselves for standards of conduct and for moral directives. 
the moment the individual began to experience the richness of his own inner life, he began to explore more carefully. And of course, even today, with all of our instruments of research, we are still not able to fully understand the internal life of the human being. But we have a realization that there's something there that we can see every day and that we can experience every day that can become much more real to us than some group of deities on high Olympus. So little by little, man took over the world, took over the universe, and most of all, took over his own life. When he did this, it became important for him to look around for landmarks, to find something to build his new way of life upon. It finally occurred to him that the old way wasn't bad, that the t golden rules and the Ten Commandments were reasonably solid, and that it was going to be very difficult to undermine them. It therefore came about that the individual continued to accept the revelations of his sacred prophets and sacred books but began the process of interpreting them, to bring them into focus with his current need, to gradually transform or transfer the old doctrine to his own psychic life, so that he could become, in a sense, the master of his own destiny. Probably the most important period in the transference of this pattern was that which occurred between the 2nd century B.C. and the 3rd century A.D., so far as Europe and even most of Asia are concerned. At that time, there was in Alexandria, Ephesus, Antioch, and a number of other centers of caravan routes, a polyglot culture developing. People of many beliefs assembled there. Uh, to trade and barter, and in many instances to communicate the choicest secrets of their moral lives. Therefore, we have an opportunity presented to the citizens of these communities to select the things they would believe. They had many opportunities. Some stranger from far away brought an interesting idea, and the Greek or the Egyptian or the Semite decided it was pretty good, so he took it and put it into his faith. Another came from a different locality with some scientific discovery, some religious conviction, and others in Antioch or Ephesus thought that was pretty good and, and saw how it fitted in to their own belief. And as a result, they built it in to their own belief. This process is continuing even today, and nearly every student of comparative religion working today is seeking to find what is useful to him out of the religions of the world and create his own faith based upon the recognition of his own need in the terms of the available solutions. Little by little, this procedure went on until it became obvious that the old idea that progress was bestowed by deities, that changes were the result of mutations beyond human control, this changed to the idea that new attitudes, new realizations, new stratagems of intelligence could come from within the person, that the great oracle was perhaps his own heart. He knew that it was the center of his life, but he had never really made it the center of his philosophy of life. He knew that he had a mind that could help him to form various implements, make pottery, weave cloth, do beadwork. Also that this mind enabled him to travel in various places enabled him to gradually discover certain secrets of health and to have, uh, defend himself against his enemies. 
all this coming from his own mind, gradually changed his point of view. He no longer prayed to the Olympian deities to save him from trouble. He sought inside himself for the remedy to his own problem. The result is what we call mysticism. Mysticism is nothing more nor less than the transference of the supreme power from some outside source to an internal source. Now, mysticism did not deny the outside source. Mysticism did not destroy the gods or condition them adversely. Mysticism pointed out the important point that the gods that we worship in the sky are inside of ourselves, that the divine power at the base of all things animates each living thing, that it is not necessary to search on some distant mountain in order to be close to deity. It was only necessary to recognize the divinity in your own heart. Paul very clearly stated this in his establishment of what might be termed the Messianic Christianity. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Mysticism has been built on the indwelling divinity. It has been built upon the concept that it is only an indwelling divinity that can legitimately and justly administer creation. We tried very hard to get used to the idea that God wandered about and carefully checked every human being as to his orthodoxy and his morality. Deity watched every move of every human being, and from this came to certain decisions as to whether this individual was worthy of being saved or not. Gradually, this thing we call the mind working with this problem found it extremely difficult to rationalize. The uh, idea of what were called the azonic deities, deities that had no abode in time or place, but were always and everywhere. This was becoming a difficult thing to understand. But the moment the individual accepts that within himself, in his own heart, is the judge and jury, that will regulate his conduct. This is quite different. Then the God in him can watch his every action day and night. And the God in his neighbor will do the same thing for his neighbor. And it became impossible to conceive of an error, a false judgment, or a confusion, because everything became a direct relationship with the person committing or performing an action. This type of thinking gradually resulted in the rise of a magnificent system of religious philosophy that flourished in North Africa at about the beginning of the Christian era. Here, various systems came together, each one bringing with it the choicest elements of its own beliefs. Here in Alexandria, Hinduism flourished. Flourish. Here, Buddhism had its stronghold. Here, the doctrines of Persia, of all the Babylonian and Chaldean empires, found rooting. Here, also, early Christianity and Judaism uh, became part of the daily life of the people. And out of this complex of beliefs, there arose a system of philosophy which is perhaps best defined by as Neoplatonism, in which all wisdom was explored and interpreted in terms of interior experience. All things had to be solved from within the believer. The answer was not to be found outside. If he thought he got the answer from the outside, it was because the internal faculties of his own consciousness bestowed it, but it seemed to be separate from his ordinary cognitions. So everyone in those days recognized that each religion, whether it was Buddhism or Semitism 
or whatever it might be, had found it necessary to develop a mysticism. It had to have it because it was impossible to hold the minds of people to a completely literal revelation. It was impossible to prevent the mind from growing. And that which had been acceptable before the mind developed was no longer acceptable after the mental processes were available. So the individual took the old beliefs and with the aid of his mind brought them into a contemporary focus for his own use, making it possible for him to find the solution to his inner experiences from the world's structure of knowledge. One of the answers to this, of course, comes in a division that took place between what we call today idealism and materialism. Idealism was an interpretation of nature in the terms of a loving deity or a universal process essentially benevolent. Materialism was the denial of this and the emphasis was upon uh, simply accidental or providential incidents and the individual never had any foundation whatsoever for confidence in the universe to which he belonged. This difference of opinion created schools of interpretation. Modern science is largely based upon the materialistic interpretation and modern religion upon the idealistic and modern philosophy is, so to say, in a state of deadly confusion between the two. No one seems to know in philosophy just what to do about these things. But philosophy, to be of importance and significance, must gradually verge toward idealism because it must recognize a legitimate reason for the occurrences of life. Failure to do this makes, philo makes philosophy a dead end as far as a contribution to human progress could be concerned. Now, in the beginning of this Neoplatonic tradition, we find Platonism, Pythagoreanism, all of these schools of thought coming in together to create a new concept, namely the concept of the open door back to reality. If the God in man is part of a supreme being, a fragment of the eternal, then the answer to the human problem is for this fragment to return to that of which it is a part. And the God in each has the power, the authority, and the means to be restore its identity with the God of all. Thus there was the, the need for the development of a means of increasing internal culture. The ancients were just as aware as we are of the dangers of war. They realized that petty nuisances flourished all over the earth. They knew of the corrupt rulers and the corrupted peoples. They knew of exploitation, of war, and of all the difficulties that beset us. I remember noting that in the Code of Hammurabi of Babylon, one of the earliest of all codes to govern conduct, there was a long and complete section dealing what to do with home builders who shotted the materials. And when the house fell down, uh, the law stepped in and really made an issue of it. And that was thousands of years ago. So the problems have not changed too much, except perhaps they've become a little more numerous and a little more forceful. But in the problems themselves, the great question was to find a solution. And here, these mystics, recognizing the need for a program of forwardness, uh, began to organize their concepts of the future. The Sibyls prophesied the times to come. 
The prophets and sages and philosophers contemplated the philosophic empire, and religions meditated upon the mystery of the second coming and the new Jerusalem. These were interpretations, they were expansions, extensions, based upon the need of certain advancements by persons who could not survive under the conditions of the old order of things. This means that the mystics worked in very many different ways, not only to plan a future, but if possible to learn how to build together for a definite goal. In this cycle of things we had all kinds of appearances rise over the horizon. Nearly every religion developed an esoteric section. It developed a group within itself who uh, this group which was able to clearly integrate available knowledge and focus it upon the shape of things to come. The sage no longer contemplated things as they are. He began to think of things as they must become through the active effort of intelligence. The sage began not only to believe in honesty, but to realize from experience the tragedies of dishonesty. It was no longer an empirical believing. It was no longer the Ten Commandments shouted from the tops of Sinai. Now it was experience, the individual living in a world which broke the rules and suffered, and the philosopher contemplating the possibility of keeping the rules and in this way transcending suffering and establishing a better world. These thoughts developed in a number of ways, but the essential point of the whole mysticism of the early Christian period was that it was possible for the human being, because of a deity in himself, to unfold every virtue necessary for his enlightenment. It was not necessary to assume that there had to be some divine intercession. There only had to be the release of the eternal divine from within the person himself. Now how was this release to be accomplished? It's obvious that in a way it is happening all the time. The release of the inner life of the person is through experience. By experience we ultimately learn what is good and what is bad. We may topple empires, destroy races, and overwhelm civilizations, but ultimately we will learn what is right from experience. But it is a long and painful journey. It therefore occurred to some of these people, the more enlightened of them certainly, that it was possible to achieve a great, greater leadership in the control of experience, that it was possible to find what the alchemist said, that art can perfect nature. In other words, that there was an art of living that could be studied, could be learned, and could be achieved, and was just as real and just as useful as any academic course that the person could take. Gradually it became aware, that, uh, uh, obvious, that academics could teach the individual to use the world as he knew it, but mysticism could help him to change the world. And we have always, in our time especially, regretted the conservative attitude of, of academic knowledge. Instead of leading, it is clinging desperately to the old procedures and uh, struggling to maintain a prestige that is in most instances outworn. But in the mystical processes of things, the front door is always open. There is always the possibility of progress, of growth. Art can perfect nature. There must be an art of perfecting man. There has to be a science of salvation. There has to be a real, organized, factual road that leads from the present state of the individual 
to the fulfillment and unfoldment of his entire body of, pot of potentials, of inner capacities, of abilities, long locked. Many persons are not even aware that they possess these abilities, but nevertheless they are there. And ev every individual has the seed of perfection within himself. Out of this kind of thinking came a series of organized movements in early religion. One of these was the Hermetic tradition of Egypt, the mysterious philosophy of Hermes Trismegistus, the thrice great Hermes, the founder of a great system which gradually mingled itself with Gnosticism. It was here also that alchemy had its beginning, for alchemy was nothing more than a science of art perfecting nature. Here came the Kabbalah to help to re release the mind from the jots and tittles of scripture and allow the inner life of the individual to fulfill the law which these scriptures required. Here was also astrology which was originally a psychology of the universe. It was a way of interpreting the universe as an organism, as a living thing. It was a psychological entity, whereas astronomy was merely a physiological entity as far as the heavens were concerned. And the ancient systems of Ptolemaic astrology became a clue to the unfoldment of man, and the astrology became a factor in the development of the healing arts. It became a factor in government. Almost every field that wanted an organized plan for development began to copy the structure of the solar system, which was to them the largest complete entity available to them. So everywhere and all down through the centuries, this process of building a way out of the labyrinth dominated a certain group of persons. It came as a series of experiences. And uh, as the early church fathers pointed out, most of the experiences that brought about enlightenment were sad. They were experiences of grief or loss or frustration. They were something within the individual, a kind of moral sense that accused him of his own misdeeds. They were limitations and restrictions which he had to throw off in order to go on with the purpose for which he was intended. In your early Christian church you had a strong mysticism, of which perhaps the outstanding example was St. Francis de Assis. We had in him a person who had a mystical appreciation, acceptance, and participation in the total mystery of existence. And this mystery experience came from within himself. It was a light within himself which cast a glow upon everything outside of himself and enabled him to read the world by the light of his own soul. There have been many mystics, not only in Christianity and Judaism, but also in other countries. The mystics of Islam were very interesting and very dramatic in their interpretation of a combination of Semitic and Christian philosophy. In Asia, the secret sciences of yoga and Vedanta arose out of the desperate determination to accomplish what we find in one of the quatrains of the Rubaiyat, where the poet is made to say, from my base metal shall be filed the key that shall unlock the door he howls without, referring to the dervishes. Uh, from our base metal must be filed this key, for it is only in ourselves and in our own substances that this key uh, can exist. No one can give us the key. No one can open the door for us. But we can learn from each other how to be more and more worthy of receiving the key. And having received it, become sufficiently insightful to know how to turn it in the lock. 
And in the Kabbalah it is said it must be turned seven times to open the mysteries of the faith. So we have the gradual developing of a supernatural, superphysical mysticism, which, however, did not have that strange aloofness that we found in the old supernatural mythologies and theologies. It was no longer deities seated upon their mirus or their uh, Olympic heights. The, uh, the mysterious depth of things went inward. And man's inner universe became a primary object of concern. Along the way, of course, it became interesting and important to try to understand man. And so the individual used his mind and turned it in upon itself. He turned the brain in upon the mind and the mind in upon the functions of its own existence. And gradually, through the effort to understand his own mind, the human being came up with a series of divergent solutions. Some of these are now incorporated into modern psychology. Many of them are also now parts of religious structures. The study of the constitution of man and how he functions gradually took on a cosmic coloring. Many mystics saw in their own natures keys to the universal nature. They saw in the functions of their own bodies the miniatures of the functions of the great bodies in space. They fulfilled the hermetic axiom, as above, so below. That which is true of the greatest is true of the least, and that which is true of the cosmos and the galaxy is true of the tiniest gnat floating in a sunbeam. Everything is part of a great lawfulness. This lawfulness is not revealed directly by deities. It is experienced by the person himself. And in this pre process of experiencing, we have another step that is very important. Most ancient peoples were accused of idolatry. They were supposed to be out worshiping wood and stone. They were said to be completely dominated uh, by these inert uh, manufacturings of their own skills and that they were praying to something they could never answer and to which uh, they gave a false allegiance. This began another step in the study of this matter and it gradually dawned upon most of these peoples, many of them at least, that these deities that they had previously considered to be persons and had represented by imagery were really not uh, persons and could not be adequately represented by any form of imagery. These persons were ne merely the symbolical appearances of principles eternal in space. And if an image was created, this image stood for a principle and not for a personality. He did not represent an, an angry God who was going to punish his people. He did not represent any power or authority such as we know. This personification represented an aspect of the total life, the total network of interacting truths, principles, realities by which the universe is sustained. So little by little the individual got over idolatry and began to realize that idolatry belonged to the idea that things came from the outside rather than from the inside. After the beginning of the Christian era, we find that Christianity inevitably and instinctively moved toward the idea of salvation through merit. The uh, entire structure was geared uh, to the realization that man must, in some way or other, discover the inward workings of the divine plan. The New Testament and parts of the Old Testament consider the matter of prayer very carefully. And nearly all of those who have studied the, the situation carefully realize that prayer was a form of meditation, of concentration, a means of retiring into the self in science, in silence, and in solitude, in order to search out the self that is locked within us. The prayer is addressed to God. 
But the ear that hears it is the God in our own hearts, the ear that is in the heart symbol of the Egyptian philosophy. Thus, the prayer can be answered directly, but because it is in the keeping of an ineffable power, an absolute ability locked within the individual to achieve and become anything that he is resolved to accomplish that is right and proper. This also carries within it the opposite pattern, the perversion or prostitution of this internal power creates an inevitable corruption, which also must bring a sad and sorry consequence to the individual. Gradually, the motion of religions in the world and Christianity in the foreground of these motions, the motion is the, the development of internal integrity. The individual must become that which he claims to believe. If he does not become it, his belief is nothing. And uh, he will remain as he is now, sounding brass and tinkling cymbals, unless the belief that is in him changes his conduct. Now, this is one of the problems we have today, not only in the orthodox values of life, but in a great many mystical and metaphysical institutions. There are a great many groups that are still functioning on the power concept. They are thinking that some kind of a strange magic, some kind of a mysterious doctrine that has been handed down among a choice group from the beginning of time enables the individual to become all-powerful without becoming virtuous. Now this is uh, perhaps fortified and supported by the rise of dictatorships and tyrannies in the world. There have been powerful persons who were not good. There have been great changes in history brought about not for the benefit of man but to advance the glory of individuals and to exploit human nature. So that it is very important for the modern mystic, Christian or non-Christian, to realize personal responsibility in the practice of faith. If this responsibility is not accepted, the ends to be achieved are not accomplished. I have known a great many cases, several that I have very closely known, of people who joined organizations and were bitterly hurt. These organizations promised them a kind of enlightenment that would carry them successfully uh, through life, would add to prosperity, would make them successful in business, add a little wealth here and there, overcome all the debilities of character and perhaps even the debilities of health. Be hurt. These organizations promised them a kind of enlightenment that would carry them successfully uh, through life, would add to prosperity, would make them successful in business, add a little wealth here and there, overcome all the debilities of character, and perhaps even the debilities of health. One of the most pathetic uh, of these cases is one in which I visited the hospital to spend a few moments, the last moments, with a person who all over a period of years had known that the particular doctrine that they followed would permit them to live without death, and then they found themselves dying. The promise was, of course, a vacancy. It was not possible. But the disillusionment was incredible. The person had believed that immortality rested in the revelation of a secret technique to do something. And they had practiced the technique for half a lifetime or more, and nothing happened. This is part of the problem of nearly all organizations that do not emphasize that no individual can know more than he is. No bottle can be more than full. 
And when the individual is full of himself, there's no room for anything else. And this is mostly our problem. When we spend all of our time thinking about what we want, we have little time to meditate upon what we need. And that was one of the theories behind Pythagorean philosophy. He warned his disciples in, in their meditations never to ask God for favors, because in order to do so, they would have to let deity know where they were, and this would be a mistake. But in any event, the principle involved is that everywhere true growth is a transmutation. It is a transforming of base elements into spiritual growth, gold. And there are three different ways in which the ancients advanced this subject. The most simple way that they knew was to live according to the virtues of our own spirits and our own hearts. In other words, supposing we are addicted seriously to the Ten Commandments, and that is the basis of our religion. Now, the Ten Commandments remains a, a, an important co code or credo. But the individual who doesn't keep them gains nothing because he has memorized them. Nor does he gain anything because he preaches them. The point is, is he, in his own simple way, keeping them? If knowing what is right, we practice that which is right, we grow. And this growth is real. But if knowing what is right, we fail to practice what is right, then what may be appear to be growth for a moment is not, and we are ultimately confounded by our own mistakes. So everywhere, the beginning to the ancients was the practice of the common natural virtues of living the correction of dispositional tendencies, the maintenance of a happy and properly regulated home, due attention and affection to family, children, respect for parents, and moderation of living, and a certain humility toward life, a lack of arrogance, a lack of dictatorial domination, and a freedom from the aggrandizement of self. These things are the common virtues of life. And if they are more or less assiduously practiced, then the individual is beginning to release spiritual value within himself. Now, the second way in which he can accomplish these, uh, this purpose depends entirely upon the first. The first virtue is a cathartic virtue. That is, it is a cleansing. And the individual who doesn't cleanse his heart and mind of his common mistakes will go no further. He can never hurdle over them. He can never say, the Lord will forgive my disposition because I can't control it. That is not a problem, because the Lord that must live with the disposition is in you and suffers from your dis disposition every day. It is not a separate power, but is part of your own consciousness. Then, after you have had a certain cathartic uh, discipline, where you have cleansed and purified your heart and mind as far as possible uh, from the ordinary mistakes of living, then the ancients declared it became necessary to gain control of both the mind and the emotions. The first step was to cleanse them so that they did no harm. The second was to control them so that they could be used constantly and consciously for the attainment of the purposes for which they were intended. The mind is given to the individual to think with, and the quality of his thinking is something he must control. It is necessary for him to recognize his responsibility to use the mind for the advancement of himself and the general benefit of society. Unless he uses these faculties properly, they will not be expanded. We must be faithful into little things if we wish to become part of greater things. So in the emotions and the mind, the correction of small mistakes opens the way to great achievements. And the gradual disciplining of life 
means not only to be honest in the terms of the Ten Commandments, but to so change and discipline moods that temper will not escape from us, that our dispositions will not become acid with a few disappointments, or that we will become belligerent over the things that we do not believe. And one of the best and most important rules is to get over judging other people and uh, assume the need for self-judgment and that this self-judgment must not be dominated by egotism. So the person practices meditation, the Pythagorean disciplines. He uh, goes into religious orders. He goes further and further into the search for spiritual integrities as they are dramatized in the rituals of the mysteries and the solemnities of the Mass. All of these things have a tendency to stimulate, to release, to inspire, and to encourage. Great music, great art, these release soul power. They release the use of energy from mediocre waste to well-directed purpose. Then in the third and highest step of discipline, there comes the quiet experience of the, of the presence of of God, the recognition and experience within self of the indwelling divinity, and that this experience becomes so continuous and so certain and so complete that the individual then walks together with the Lord at all times throughout life. And this achievement brings the person to the degree in which the leadership of the spirit within himself leads him back along the path to the center of life, the center in his own heart, and the center in the heart of space. The person has to earn these things. Evolution is this earning. Evolution is the discovery of the fact and gradually the strength to obey and fulfill this fact. Today with Christianity we have great needs. We have very great needs for a mystic Christian revelation. It is coming. There are a number of groups arising who are recognizing that Christianity is not a problem for theology. Christianity is a problem of human regeneration through conscious effort. Christianity will remain uh, inept in its management of world affairs so long as it counts upon its numerical strength or upon its traditional privileges. But the power of Christianity must be the power to transform the weaknesses of human nature, the conflicts of social order, and all these destructive uh, misunderstandings by the light of the availability of the power of truth. To the average Christian mystic, to most Christian mystics, and to many others of other faiths, the Christ represents primarily the perfect enlightenment of the human soul. The Christ principle is, in a sense, the presence of the divine in each living thing. It is present even in the smallest creature that lives, but in man it is the symbol of the perfect achievement in life. The story is partly undoubtedly biographical and it is partly symbolical. It is part of the great mystery ritual that has descended for the regeneration of man and has been present in every religion in the world. The Christened person is the one who has turned the control of life over to the Christ principle within himself. And this principle stands for all that is good and it stands for the possibility, in fact the reality, of the gradual release of the Christ principle through our own composite natures. And this, according to the mystics, was the second coming. It was the coming of the Christ principle in our daily conduct, the gradual regeneration and reformation of our own life and the way we live it and the things that we do every day. Now as we gather again for Christmas, and we are very close to that time now, 
we should have some thought for these values that we have a tendency to accept but do not actually apply. We've never had a greater opportunity than today to make the Christian religion a fact in our daily life. But this fact is not in terms of architecture. It is not in terms of the constant repetition of words which have comparatively slight meaning for us. We believe in them. We hope that they are all true. Some of these words are in, implying the, the danger to the soul if we don't keep them, and others the glories of the soul if we do keep them. But the real fact remains that the Christ person, the Christian, is the person who has been christened. And to be christened it means, in essential, uh, to be dedicated to the revelation of the God power within himself. Now, it's all, we can say that's fine, but how do we do it? Uh, what do we do in cases like this? How are we going to apply uh, our daily conduct to fulfill so exalted a concept? I think the first thing we have to try to do is to con uh, get a concept of this. If we can really finally come to realize that salvation is within, and we have much evidence to support it, because if you look around you in the world, you see that so-called salvation from the outside is not working. It never could. Salvation is a result of accepting something, but doing nothing about it is simply a fallacy. I remember in growing up, I was in an area where there were a number of annual evangelists that came down through the small towns and converted people. And it was really quite, a, quite an interesting and inspiring spectacle. And maybe two or three hundred of the town people saw the glory and uh, were converted. But the minister, one of them, told me later, he said it was necessary to come back every year and reconvert them. <laughs> because nothing of that nature, these high notions maintained by an emotional ecstasy, seldom would last for more than 12 months. By that time, the alcoholic was back on the bottle, and the uh, unpleasant parent was back making his family miserable. So it was necessary to convert about every year. And anything that approaches religion on the basis of conversion is on this problem. It will not help. The only answer has to be that the individual recognizing that he has the capacity because of the divine principle within him to be anything that he will be by dedication. But that if by any chance he wants to use this divine principle for selfish ends, he is then a first-class Satanist. Because to use God for less than his own purposes must be considered as treason. But if the individual slowly and cautiously and carefully does allow growth to take place, permits himself to cling to principles, to weigh all things, and every day try to see or experience some proof of a truth or an ideal which he should be applying. If he will do this, he will not make a great change in history, but he may make a great change in himself. He will begin to realize that we can be defeated simply by lack of right motive, that we can come to nothing because we have not placed our goal where it belongs. The end of our life is not that we should be rich, powerful, distinguished, or have a wide sphere of influence. The end of our life is not that we should convert everybody else to what we believe. The end of living is to grow in grace, grow in spirit, grow within ourselves, not by our own effort, but by the presence of a power within ourselves. And this brings us a little bit into the problem of the Christ and the Antichrist. The individual is starting in to grow, really sincerely trying, begins to experience interferences. 
he begins to be tempted to compromise just a little or to point out a certain temper fit and justify it on the grounds of righteous indignation. Also, if he's a little less than honest, it probably will be overlooked uh, because the rest of the world is a little less than honest. These things arise from what the Greeks call the ego, the personal self. And this personal self is the prince of this world who has nothing in God. But the temptation to be less than ourselves arises from the mental process by means of which we visualize the pleasure of doing something that is not proper or that we do not believe sufficiently in the integrities to allow them to stand against the appetites or the temptations. So we have to watch very carefully as we go along to see that we do not slip a little. As they used to say in the old days down to the river, we would not become a backslider. The back backslider is one who goes two steps forward and three backwards in the development of his moral nature. Temptations become more and more prominent, more and more pressing. And the moment we begin to practice them or accept them, they increase in strength and power until finally they block practically every effort of the individual to release the best of himself. Even in the arts this is true because the temptation of wealth or success in art generally destroys the integrity of art. And every compromise that we make of values reduces our probability of achieving that which we most need and desire. This does not mean that uh, the good life, the religious life, is one of frustration. Uh, the whole idea that we have to give up, inhibit, or restrict, deny ourselves of everything we want in order to be good is completely untrue. We, uh, if we have to deny ourselves everything because it interferes or these things interfere with goodness, then there's something wrong with the things we like. Uh, we should realize that if the fulfillment of desire requires a compromise of character, then there's something wrong with the desire. And that this is the problem. There are things we want which we should not have. There are things we want to do that we should not do. But if our personal feelings are strong enough to make us do these things, then we are in the presence of the tempter. For the tempter is nothing more or less than the human ego, the mind, telling us that we can get away with a little larceny occasionally. And we cannot. The principles in, within the individual are so exact that they are like the motion of atoms or molecules or electrons. Everything is exact. There are no approximates. There are no uh, try it over again attitudes. Everything has to be what it should be. The development of integrity is an exact science. But it is not a frustration. An individual who will spend 20 years, perhaps, practicing five hours a day to become a violinist does not seem to begrudge the effort. If he's a real musician, it'll be because he loves music. If he is a technician without the deeper side of his art, then he will be glad to do it for the sake of the fees that he can collect. But he does it. And as a result of that, he becomes an expert. And because he becomes an expert, he becomes famous. And so on and so on and so on. Now, a person who is willing to do all this for the sake of of playing a violin should not believe it be to be a terrible hardship to practice the integrities or to practice the presence of God in his own life. The only reason why he is inclined to doubt it is because the musician thinks he has a little business lying ahead, whereas the practice of the virtues seems to be only rewarded in heaven and many people who are looking for rewards here and now. But the problem remains that the moment we depart from the realities, we fall into the slough of despond, as it is called in Pilgrim's Progress. So the person has to decide 
to try. We won't be perfect at it. No one will. To try as far as possible when we think of our faith, to think of living it. Now, we have a very difficult year probably coming up. It's not going to be as easy by any means in these times for the individual to live what he believes. He will be forced by circumstances to compromise or thinks he is forced. He should, however, very carefully weigh the temptations and the motivations for the attitudes that he may take in these emergencies. He must try to prove to himself first that he is, he is sincere, that he is not trying to find a way out of trouble. He is trying to find a way of learning more about life. The eternal principles of things have settled this world as a training establishment for the graduation of souls. As the Rosicrucians say, this is the A.B. Sidarian for the education of children studying in the school of the Holy Spirit. This is the what in sense it is. We are all here to learn how to live. And it's a long and difficult job. But in the course of it, we will finally come to the realization that doing the best job possible makes the best life possible and also the easiest way of getting to the goals that we want. So as we come to Christmas, we have to be very careful in our thinking. Today, most people are much disillusioned at Christmas. They feel that the entire situation is highly uh, extravagant and is commercialized and that uh, most persons face it half-heartedly. Well, that may all be true, but no matter what any other person does, Christmas to you must always be what it does for you or what it does to you. And this is the important thing. Anything that Christmas brings out of you in the form of graciousness, kindness, thoughtfulness, gentleness, these virtues, anything that Christmas inspires you to achieve in those areas is well worth whatever it costs. That which uh, enables you to gradually dismiss it all and, be, and live with yourself is most almost certainly a matter of self-centeredness and lack of spiritual insight. It is very important that in these times that we try to do that which is the most gracious and the most kindly. Now this does not mean that we have to be extravagant. It does mean, however, that we must over the Christmas season, perhaps especially, stop judging people, stop criticizing them, and try to discover, if possible, the constructive relationship between ourselves and these other people. If somebody so commits an action that it provides us with an opportunity for forgiveness, that we can forgive them, the forgiving of them is a greater good to us than the injury could possibly have been a harm to us. If wherever we become better, wherever we show higher indications of our own integrities, we grow and become more vital and uh, move toward that desired end. Now, with Christmas coming again, uh, we, we want to see family, we want to see friends, we want to make as much of it as we can. We do not want Christmas to be simply a spending spree. No one wants that. On the other hand, I've talked to some people who object to Christmas as a spending spree, and you'd be surprised what their explanation is. One person told me that he didn't believe in buying Christmas presents because he believed in spending his money on himself. Now, this is a thought. Now, it might possibly be, if you dig a little bit into it, there might be a trace of ulterior motive in this attitude that we have. <laughs> Another individual will say, well, I'm not going to send anything to the Joneses because I sent them something last year and what they sent me wasn't worth anything. <laughs> this is another justification for nothing. These things are the false attitudes upon this proposition. Then the idea that we want to get rid of it because it's become a merchant's holiday, we must remember that if we do get rid of it, 
we are probably placing another nail in the coffin of Christianity. It's not to get rid of it, it is to do the right thing with it that is important. We should never give up anything which inspires. We should never give up any occasion which makes it possible for us to unite in fellowship and in understanding and in cheerful union for common good. We must try to protect these values regardless. And every effort to get out of them because they interfere, because they are money wasters or time wasters, uh, this type of thinking is negative and is simply adding to the unreligious majority of mankind. On the other hand, to make something good out of Christmas is an achievement. It brings something with it that is valuable. It helps us perhaps to remember the forlorn and the forgotten. I know of cases where a Christmas card is the only thing some people have sent to their relatives once a year for the last 20 years. And if by some chance the relative doesn't send them one the next year, they don't send the relative one. This is not Christianity. This is carefully considered a uh, problem of what is the greatest advantage or the least trouble to ourselves. So this year, whatever it is, let's try to do something to keep the spirit of this thing alive. If you have your religious groups, attend them. Go and share them with them in music and in some simple religious belief some people don't go to these religious places because they think they're too elementary the, the message is not exalted enough but it isn't a matter of how exalted or not it is it's whether or not it helps people in the various levels of life where they live we're not all living on the same level but we must all strive in one way or another to understand the levels on which other people live and at the same time understand why we've got to raise our own occasionally if we really want to get somewhere. So whatever it is, use a certain amount of festivity and uh, do not spend too much time regretting world conditions. After all, we caused them. And whether we like it or not, we're going to have to pay for them ultimately. The world conditions did not descend as it falleth from heaven. It came right out of our daily relationships with each other. And these conditions will not be cured until a better part of ourselves leads the rest of ourselves. And uh, I think it was Marcus Aurelius who said on one occasion, a man is a little flesh and a little air and that which commands and that is what we all are we're just mind, body, little air but, but that which commands Marcus Aurelius was a mystic that which, was, which commands is the best part of ourselves and when the best leads the rest growth is inevitable but when we block the best and strive desperately to escape the challenge of self-improvement we are in serious trouble. So we're going to have some difficulties in the coming years. The world is very much upset. But I think we have to realize that as citizens of the universe, each of us has our, his own responsibility. Each of us must do that which he sees it, and the best as he knows, for the God of things as they are. Each of us must try to be prepared for the changes that arise. We must be prepared for the tragedies that may come. But if we have inward security in principles, if we have turned our destiny over to the highest part of ourselves, whatever happens, we can handle. Whatever happens, we can be true to truth. And that is all that anyone can be expected to achieve. But there is another byproduct that is very important. And that is, as we do improve, as we do gain control of our own weaknesses, there comes into us a peace that surpasseth understanding. The fears, the doubts, the anxieties, the uncertainties, that questioning as to whether there is a God or not, these negatives fade away if the individual makes the achievement of inner integration. If the best of us leads the rest, we will live our lives 
as, it, as they should be lived. We will face changes as they should be faced. And regardless of what happens, we will realize that when we keep the truth, the truth keeps us. And when we are true to the God in ourselves, we cannot be untrue to that divine power which abides in space. For we are part of space. And in our keeping is the condition of space. For space is nothing but all that lives added up. And when we add our little bit, and that little addition is right, space is the wiser and the richer. And uh, I hope all of us will be able to make this coming Christmas a little bit special. Most of us have tried and are studying and are working. We're doing, we feel the best we can. Perhaps we are, perhaps we are not. But we really want to grow. We want to be better people. We want to be wiser servants to those who need. We want to make a happier world. And most of all, we want to bring the human pattern, the human tragedy, back again into the nature of the divine power. We want the peace to come that is permanent, the peace of man's perfect adjustment with the infinite good. We're not going to make it overnight, but in time, with effort, we'll get there. In the meantime, every kind word and every thoughtful deed is a step in the right direction. And salvation begins with a single step. And maybe each one of us in a New Year's resolution or in a Christmas dedication will make one more step in the direction of that power uh, which is locked within us and released from within ourselves the divine prisoner that has been held in bondage by the weaknesses of our own dispositions. I think if we can think things through a little bit in this way, it may make us uh, a little happier for Christmas. And at this time, I want to wish all of you a very happy and wonderful Christmas and a happy, thoughtful, inspiring, and progressive new year. May the new year bring each of us closer to the God within and the God in eternity. Thank you. Thank you.